Good evening, everyone. How's everybody doing this evening? Are we ready to continue praising the Lord? All right, that is so good to hear. Everyone, please stand. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. When everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Majesty 
enthroned above and I stand I stand in all of you I stand I stand in all of you holy God to whom all praise is due I stand Good evening. Welcome back to Trinity Baptist Temple tonight. Love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Hearing that song makes me think about how awesome God is. How many of you think you can imagine what God's going to be like when we're standing in front of him? It's going to be difficult, isn't it? You know, I read the Bible and it says around the throne there's thunderings and lightnings. And when we ever hear a thunderstorm, we always get nervous or scared. It's natural. We can't help it. But when we see all this power emanating from our God that loves us, we're going to be uh, pretty impressed. We'll stand in awe of him. Can't wait for that day. Let's pray and bless our offering this morning or this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. We just thank you, Lord, for a great uh, day in your house this morning. And we thank you, Father, for bringing us back tonight. And Lord, we, we do stand in awe of you. We, we don't know everything we need to know about you, uh, but we know that you're great. We know that you're awesome, uh, that you're beyond anything that we could ever imagine or think of. I uh, just pray, dear Lord God, that uh, we don't take anything away from you when we try to imagine what it'll be like when we stand in front of you but we do look forward to that time dear lord god tonight dear lord help us to lift you up in praise and worship you deserve so much more i pray father you bless this offering tonight and use it for your work for your kingdom and i pray dear lord god that uh, you'll bless the services tonight and we'll be sure to give you all the praise honor and glory in the name of your son jesus christ we pray amen <laughs>
stand and sing with us leaning on the everlasting arm
the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest and ever was Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they And tell how he lived again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. for me tell me the story of Jesus write on my heart every word God, the uh, story of Jesus makes all the cares and trials of this life uh, kind of pale in comparison. <laughs> you hear the, the cross and the suffering, never gets old. Thank you for being here this evening. We've um, been going through the family. We're going to continue on in that. And now we're, we've gone from the kids' responsibilities to the parents, parents' responsibilities to the kids. Now we're going to go to the wife responsibility to the husband. That's it. And I hear a yes. Oh, praise God. Amen. Y'all going to be out of town next week when we do the husbands? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> praise the Lord. I want to share a quote with you. Uh, interestingly enough, Benjamin Franklin said these words, marriage is most natural state of man, and therefore the state in which you are most likely 
defines solid happiness. It is the man and woman united that makes the complete human being. Man has not merely the value he would have in a state of union. He is an incomplete animal. Most of you wives would probably say amen, but there was no amens, right? Praise God. Amen. He's an incomplete animal, and he resembles the odd half of a pair of scissors. Again, by himself, by ourselves, we are incomplete, and uh, it's, it's a, a wonderful thing to find a wife. The Bible says that it's a, a happy is the man that finds a, a wife, and you know, One of the things that I want to remind us of of before we uh, get fully into this is the the theme behind uh, this message on the family and and the relationships within the family, the responsibilities within the family. It's all supposed to be driven on commands that are for every single Christian. So every single child of God has the responsibilities we're going to talk about. So you say, I'm not married, so I don't need to listen to this. That's wrong. Um, That's just wrong. You need to listen to this because it's the Word of God and that's what God wants you to do. So listen, um, if you're a child and you're not married yet, you need to hear this. Um, If you are unfortunately divorced or widowed, either way, as I said before, you can use this information as an encouragement to others. You can use this as just a a tool um, to be praying for the marriages uh, that are in our church. All different things that can be used, but again, All of these are based on the commands that we find in God's Word for all Christians. So the motives are the same. No matter what relationship we're talking about in the home, the motives are supposed to be the same. And I will say this probably two or three times throughout this message, the the motives and these characteristics should be seen in the home first before they're seen here in the church or out in public. So we have a responsibility to make these things evident and clear in the home before that they're evident and clear here. We're going to talk about love. Again, this should be something that is clear in the home. Our love that we have for other people shouldn't be hypocritical that we have in the home. In other words, the way that we treat our spouses, the way that we talk to our family, shouldn't be hypocritical in comparison to the way that you talk to maybe the pastor or a deacon or a fellow church member or another sister in Christ or whatever the case may be. It should be transparent. I shouldn't talk to Rochelle any other way that I wouldn't talk to anybody out here. And vice versa, we are to have a sincerity in our, on our, in, in our relationships with one another. And again, that sincer- sincerity should be at home. And um, that's just reality. We all fall short, but again, the, co- the commands stay the same. The commands are like this. In John chapter 13, verse 34, it says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have loved one to another. Matthew chapter 22 says this, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, saying all the law and the prophets. We know that Jesus was asked who, who the neighbor is, and he gave the story of the Good Samaritan. We have a responsibility to every person to love as we are loved and to love as we love, as we love ourselves, as we care for ourselves. 1 John chapter 4, again, we've shared these verses in every single uh, message. Uh, again, children's responsibility to parents, parents' responsibility to chi- children, and now wives' responsibility to husbands. These are underlying Christian principles that should apply in the home. 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Everyone that loveth is born of God. And knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And this was, uh, was manifest the love of God towards us because that He sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Again, a principle should be in the home and clear among all other relationships as well. Verse 12, No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Again, these are the motives, the foundation for every social relationship, every relationship that we have in this world as Christians. Love is to be the motive. Again, it should begin first at home. It should be clear at home before it's clear anywhere else. And uh, that again is the foundation. Let's pray. We'll move on tonight. Father, we come before you. 
Thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the opportunity tonight to worship You in song. Thank You for each person, each family that's here tonight. God, we all need a continual reminder that Your love is to be clear in our lives, especially in our homes, especially in the relationship between a husband and a wife. Um, Lord, help us to, to live lives full of love and exercising that love um, because, again, You loved us first. And so, Lord, I pray that You bless us tonight. Help us as we talk about the relationship that the wife is to have with her husband. And, Lord, help us to uh, be an encouragement to one another with this. Lord, that we wouldn't, as husbands, look at our wives and, and see how we can uh, tear them down or cut them down, but how we can honor them and how we can love them and encourage them and lead them and teach them and, and, and just be the instrument that You want uh, us to be for them. And I pray that if there's some here tonight that, that aren't married, Again, maybe they have been divorced or, or widowed. and They can be an encouragement to those who are married. And, and, and they can be one of those uh, just uh, prayer warriors for the marriage. Uh, the marriage is in our church. And uh, God, we again ask your favor. We ask your blessing on this message. We we'll praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. So, again, I share this information just about every time that I do premarital counseling and marital counseling, uh, just about every time, not, probably not 100% of the time, but just about probably 99% of, uh, of the time. I also share it in our marriage seminars that we have had before, uh, but I'll say it, I've already said it once, I'll say it again, all of these directives, all of these commands, every single one of them that we're given as Christians apply in the home first. So if you're reading in Ephesians and it says that you're to forgive as you've been forgiven, in the last part of chapter 4 in Ephesians, then that means that that applies in the home first. Forgive as you are forgiven. And so we have, again, a great responsibility to make sure what we read in God's Word, if we're Christians, they, that, that's real in the home, and it's not just real in the church or real whenever we're around other Christians. It's real. It's just sincere. This is who we are all the time. Colossians chapter 3 is where I want to begin tonight in this uh, setting. We've, we've read it. Again, in every relationship so far, because there's so much good information here. The setting is this. He's propositioning every Christian in the first few uh, words of chapter 3. He says this, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And then he says this again, to be reiterating that point. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. I want to encourage you, if you weren't here Wednesday night, to go back sometime this week and, and listen to the message that was preached Wednesday night because the, the, the reality is this. We have a great example in the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul lived a life that was sold out. And one of the things that we, we examined it is, is we aren't necessarily supposed to be apostles. Not everybody is an apostle. There's not an apostle, apostolic age right now. We aren't necessarily all supposed to be traveling evangelists, but we all are called, just like we saw again this morning, to, to be sold out, to, to give our all, just like the Apostle Paul. And last Wednesday night, we asked, how did he get to where he was? How could the Apostle Paul live the life that he lived, even though everything he had gone through, everything he was going through, how was he able to just lay it all on the line all the time, seemingly all the time? How was the Apostle Paul able to do that? And one of the things, I think the second point that I pointed out was that he saw his life literally as dead. When he gave up, when he accepted salvation, he really understood, I'm giving up all the rights that I have to my own life. I'm dead. And so he is saying this to the Colossian believers, saying, listen, if you're risen with Christ, then you should be seeking the things that are above. Matter of fact, you should set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. And he goes on and he says that. The reason why, you are dead. You no longer have any roots in this world. Your citizenship in, is in heaven. You should be seeking things above. Your mind should be set on things above. You should be living like you're going to heaven. You shouldn't be rooted in this world. And your life is not only dead, but it's hid in Christ. When people look at our lives, they should see Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said. For me to live is Christ. We have a responsibility, again, as Christians in general... For this to, to, to describe our life. And look what he goes on to say. He said, when Christ, who is our life. That's a, an amazing statement right there. When Christ, who is our life. Could, could, could we make that same 
statement. Christ is my life. We talked about it again a little bit this morning. You can have this. There's a song, Give Me Jesus. You can have this old world. Just give me Jesus. You know, that, that, that should be who we are. I just have to have Jesus. It says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. So in light of all this, that you're changed, you're dead, your life is hidden with Christ, seek th- seeking the things above, not the things of the earth. In light of all this, he says, you need to continually, that's what this, this statement here, mortify, therefore, it's, it's a continual thing. Mortify, keep them dead. Your members that are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, and ornate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. And in which you also walked some time when you lived in them. You used to live that life of sin. But now you also put, up all, put off all these things. Listen to these things that every Christian is not supposed to have in their life. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Here it is. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Then he goes on. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man and his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. He goes on, in light of the fact that this is no longer who you are, but this is who you are, he says, put on the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies and kindness and humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man, you can underline your Bible, highlight your Bible, any man, that applies in the home. Any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so in the like manner do ye, do, also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. How? In the bond of, uh, 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 of perfectness, charity. Put on charity, and in this state, You can let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you're also called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and uh, uh, hymns and spiritual songs, singing grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Verse 18, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord it's a sad thing that that word submit it seems to be such a bad word uh, in 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 modern culture today in relationships because this is a beautiful word this is a this is a privileged word it's the same exact word that is used in consideration of submitting ourselves unto the Lord same exact word it's a putting under of uh, under that Lordship and so this is what a wife is supposed to do with the spiritual leadership of her husband. He is, he is the head of the home, just like Christ is the head of the church. There is a responsibility for the wives to place themselves under that leadership, and it's, a, it, it's based off of, as Christians, the love that we have, and we'll see that in just a second, but not only the love we have, but being changed people. That we, we no longer have this rebellion. We no longer have this, not saying the old man's not there, but we don't live in that old man. We put off the old man and his deeds, like Paul said, and put on the new man, which is created in Christ, after Christ Jesus. So we have a responsibility, every Christian, and now he's saying specifically the first part here in Colossians, that wives have this responsibility as born-again believers to put themselves in submission because it's fit in the Lord. It's fitting. In the Lord. It's meat. It's right. It's what is supposed to happen. Again, this is exactly what happens when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, but not only our Savior, but our Lord. We place ourselves under Him. That's like Paul said in the very beginning of chapter 3, where he said, Our life is hid with Christ in God. That's the same thing. Our life is hid, it's, it's, it's placed under His Lordship. And wives have a responsibility to place themselves under the leadership of the husband. This is a responsibility. This is what we've been talking about, responsibilities in the relationships, in the family. In this, however, it does not mean that the wife offers nothing spiritual or helpful to the relationship. Matter of fact, it's opposite. It's it's necessary for the wife 
to interact and to encourage and to pray and to support and, and to do what's necessary. Even to be maybe that, that, that warning flag sometimes because God's given women certain things that, that men don't have. It means that if the husband declares, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, it means that every single wife is to willingly follow that leadership. What does that look like? What does what that following look like? Well, I want to tell you what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like, well, honey, uh, do you feel like going to church today? And I hope I don't make anybody mad, but that's not the leadership that a wife is to put herself under. I'm not saying that she rebels if that's her husband. I'm not saying that. But the leadership that we as husbands are supposed to provide is not like, do you feel like going to church today? Do you feel like getting up and getting ready? Hey, do you feel like getting out of bed and going back to church tonight? That's not the leadership that God has expected for husbands to have in the home. The same regard, it's not supposed to be, well, honey, uh, I know that I'm supposed to be at church tonight, but man, this game is the big one. It's the big game. Th- th- this, this, this movie, the, it's, it's a Sunday night preview. It's very, real important. I know I need to be at church, but really got to catch this movie. Hey, they're having a special prize down at the movie theater tonight, Sunday night, and, and I really want to see that. That's not the leadership that husbands are supposed to provide in the home. And that's not the leadership that wives need in following. Again, or that the Lord requires. I want to look at another place in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. He says this, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. What... For what glory is it if when you, are, you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? If you do something wrong and you get corrected for doing wrong, what's the big deal if you endure that chastisement? But if when you do well and you suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. He goes on, verse 21, For even hereunto were you called because, here it is, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, Neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were as sheep going astray, but now are returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So here's the example. Christ did these things. He humbled himself. He submitted. He, he didn't revile. He didn't pay back. He lived a life of obedience and, 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 and again, submission to the Father. He was committed to this. And in this, he left us an example, the Scripture says. And he goes on in verse uh, 1 of the next chapter. And so, likewise, he says, in that same manner, just as the example we have for Christ, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your, subjection to your own husband. Again, Christ, when he was threatened, when he was beaten, when he was persecuted, when he was reviled, when he was lashed, when he was beaten and crucified, he didn't do anything in retaliation. He didn't pay back. He just stayed completely, he stood completely submitted to the role that he was sent to accomplish. And wives, that's what he's saying. Likewise, you stay submitted to the role that God has called you to in being in subjection to your own husband. Why? Because if there's any that obey not the word, they also may be without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. If your husband ain't leading spiritually, if he's not, if he's not showing demonstration of spiritual fruit, if there's no evidence, uh, you know, here's the Sunday night crowd, so I'm kind of preaching the choir here, but it, your husband's not necessarily leading spiritually like he's supposed to. Maybe he's not saved. I'm not trying to say you need to go home and say, well, I know what your problem is now. You're, you're not saved, you know. What Brother Kyle said. No, that's not, that's not necessarily the truth. But um, there is a conduct that a wife is supposed to have that's independent of what the husband does. 
And that is to, again, be obedient to the role and, and the call. Um, and in that faithfulness, God may use that conduct, that, that lifestyle, that example of the wife to win the husband and even others without the body of Christ. He goes on, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear whose adorning, let it not be of the outward adorning of plating of the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel. Don't put the focus on the outside, he says. Listen, there's nothing wrong with wanting to, 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 to put on modest apparel and, 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 and to feel good about yourself. But that shouldn't be the focus of your life, ladies. That's what he's saying. It doesn't need to be. The, the, the most important thing when you get up in the morning is I'm concerned about what other people think about my image. That's what American culture says. That's what the world says. That's not what God says. God says, don't let that be your focus. Don't put all of your, your focus on that. He says, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. Put your attention on those things in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And so again, there's nothing wrong with modest apparel and, 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 and you know, makeup or you know, uh, jewelry and and make sure your hair's not windblown when you walk into the door and, and all this, you know, the, I'm not saying anything wrong with that, but if that is the, the focus of your life, there's something wrong with that. The focus of your life should be the inward man of the heart, that, that hidden man in the heart, the, the person who you are, making sure that the inner person is being adorned with the Word of God and, and with that meek and quiet spirit and making sure that's the focus of your life. He says, for after this manner... In the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Now he says this in verse 7. We're not talking about the husbands that are doing this as a, as a matter of pointing out. He says it's the same mindset that Christ had that, we, that wives are supposed to have as far as being in subjection to the role and responsibility that God has called them to. Now he goes on to verse 7, it says the same exact thing. Likewise, ye husbands, in the same manner, submitted to the will of God, dedicated to God's call, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Listen to this word, th this statement. That your prayers be not hindered. That's a, that's a very sobering statement. That your prayers be not hindered. Again, this is finishing a, a thought from going all the way down to what Christ's example is for us, that wives are, are supposed to follow in the same manner of submission and obedience to the Lord. Husbands are supposed to follow in the same submission and obedience to the Lord to their roles, and so that you can dwell together and that you can have prayers that aren't hindered and that you can be heirs of the grace of life. God's given us this stewardship in this life. Blessings of marriage. Blessings of family. It's all by His grace. And we have been given this honor to carry this around. And if we disregard the roles in our life, if we disregard the responsibilities that we have, then I promise you this. Our prayers will be hindered. It's like we said this morning. If God said it, that's the reality. So I will say this. Maybe you're here tonight. And you've been struggling in your spiritual life. I would venture to say there's a lot of difficulties in spiritual lives because there's an improper dynamic in the marriage relationship. A lot of times people, oh, I've prayed for this and I've prayed for that and I've prayed for this and I've prayed for that and this and that and, and my prayers aren't being answered. Sometimes it's because the husband and wife aren't submitted to the roles in the way they're supposed to be submitted. Again, he says that your prayers be not hindered. It's, it's a role, and it's a way it's supposed to be uh, carried out in the home. Again, we wonder why sometimes those prayers aren't answered. Maybe it's because there's an improper dynamic in the home. Maybe the wife is trying to run, and maybe the husband says, what do you feel like? You don't feel like going to church tonight? No, no, that's improper spiritual dynamic. That's improper. It's not the wife, hey, I'm going to church. You plan on going? No, no, that's not, that's improper. So is this. Hey, I'm the man of the house and you're going to listen to what I, no, that's improper. What did he say? Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. 
to love and to, to cherish our wife and to esteem them as a precious gift from God. That's, that's the responsibility that husbands have. So it's not something that we, we throw our weight around and, hey, now I bring home the bacon, you cook it, you know? It's not, it's not that mindset. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a man working and providing and, and a woman taking care of the home and, and cooking. There's nothing wrong with that. But the mentality and the heart behind, you're going to do what I say because I'm the head of the house. That's not the type of leadership. It's not the example we have even in Christ. And so we have to realize there's responsibilities and it has to be maintained within, again, the proper dynamics. So if the husband and the wife aren't willing to do what is necessary, what's commanded of them, and I will say this, there's spiritual blockage. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but there's probably almost every single one of us in here who've been married for an amount of time that can raise their hand and say, when there's issues in the marriage, my spiritual life isn't where it's supposed to be. It just, things seem out of sync. There's a reality to that. Again, we have a responsibility to yield to the Holy Spirit, to yield to the roles in our marriage. And when both people are seeking the Lord and both people are, uh, are fulfilling the roles that they're supposed to do with love as the motive, I will say this. There, there is an intimacy and a, and a specialness that is available inside of marriage that is only available inside of marriage when that is the case. When you're both seeking God, when you're both serving God, when you're both just trying to live your lives for the Lord and fulfill the roles and you're, you're being motivated by love. Hey, guys, if, if you're, you're wanting uh, to tune things up, and I know there's kids in here, but if there's, uh, and ladies, if, if, if you're wanting a little more on, on your side as well, then, then listen, I would encourage you with this. Get in God's word. Seek God's face together. Pray and, and, and serve the Lord. Be sincere and, and, and fulfill your roles in love. Just do what you're supposed to do no matter what they're supposed to do. And I promise you this, there's going to be a fire that you didn't know was, it was possible because there's something that goes on when everything spiritually is in sync. You can't explain it. You can't explain it physically, emotionally. It's when everything is right spiritually. And so we have a responsibility to yield like Christ yielded in his life. Again, this is a standard for all Christians. This is what we're all supposed to do. He goes on, finally, be ye all of one mind, he says, having compassion one of another. Love is brethren. Again, this is a general uh, command for every Christian. So even if you're married or not in here, this applies to you, but it applies first in the home if you're married. He says, love is brethren. Be pitiful, courteous. Sometimes courtesy goes out the window in marriages. Not rendering evil for evil. Our girls know that right. Not rendering evil for evil. We, we've taught them before. That, that, hey, hey, she hit me. Why'd you hit her? Well, because she hit me first. And I said, hey, the Bible says don't render evil for evil. So then they smack, smack. Well, hey, another day, another week. Hey, what's going on in here? I didn't render evil for evil. I didn't render evil for evil. <laughs> and uh, I said, hey then don't do evil, period. I don't know. The Bible says. But um, it says, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise, blessing, knowing, and that's, that's too, that's what we taught them. Listen, if they hit you, you give them a hug. You be nice to them. Give a blessing. Do good to them that do evil unto you. You do those things, what the Bible says. And so it says, knowing that you're uh, there unto called, that you should inherit a blessing, for he that will love life and see good days, hear this, he that will love life, hey, how many men want to love life and see good days? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many wives want to love life and see good days? Amen. A lot, a lot of people in here that want to do that. Look what he says next. Let him refrain his tongue from evil. That's pretty simple. In his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Seek peace. Oftentimes in marriage, it doesn't seem like we're just waiting for the next fight. That shouldn't be in marriage. We should be seeking peace, and we should be ensuing, making sure that peace abides or remains. He goes on and says, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, ears open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Again, uh, we had a marriage seminar uh, last month, and in our marriage seminar, the theme was guided by grace. Guided by grace. Again, this applies for us as Christians period, but especially in the home, guided by grace. Christian homes should best demonstrate 
what a right relationship with the Lord looks like. A husband and wife's relationship should demonstrate exactly what our relationship with Christ looks like. That's the model. That's the example. But with the idea of guided by grace in, in our minds, what is grace? If we're going to be guided by grace, what is grace? Grace is, of course, giving what is undeserved or unmerited or even unasked for. Grace is giving no matter what. It's enhancing. And that's what we talked about. And again, in our marriage seminar, it was, it was talking about giving even when something's not asked for. Giving even when something's not deserved or merited. It's just doing and giving and being exactly who God wants us to be. But the reality is we get into ruts inside of marriage. We get inside of a, a routine. We, we just deal with the way things are sometimes. And oftentimes in our marriage, we find ourselves competing. Competing for time, competing for affection, competing with one another, competing with each other spiritually, competing in all different ways. So it becomes this endeavor to keep the score. Who, who is doing better? Who, who's the better spouse? It becomes a battle. In the marriage seminar, I sang a song for the couples, and, 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 and it's called Love's Not a Fight, but it's worth fighting for. And, but oftentimes, again, that's what sometimes in marriages, even Christian marriages, it seems like there's this battle, this competition, this, this scorekeeping, and, and it shouldn't be. Marriage, again, is a blessing from God Almighty. It's something that we are to enjoy. It's something that is to be a blessing. It's not to be a battle. It's not to be, Satan would, would have his way and, and it would be destructive, but God wants it to be a blessing because it's a gift. It's the first of all social institutions and we are to t take very good care of it. But I'll say this, we need to realize some things inside of marriages. We need to realize our re responsibilities are real and we need to own up to them. We don't need to pass them on and say, oh, I just can't right now, you don't understand what's going on in our marriage. We need to own up to our responsibilities and our roles no matter what, period. That's just the reality. If you're a husband here tonight, you need to own up to what the responsibility that God has given you as a husband. We need to own up to them. Wives, we need to quit making excuses as well and own up to the responsibilities that God has put in His Word. If we can't, we feel like we can't, then we need to repent. We need to say, God, I'm in, I'm in sin. I'm in rebellion. I can't be the wife I'm supposed to be because of this or because of that or because I don't like when he does this or I don't like how he says that or like he doesn't never do this and or whatever we need to repent and reconcile we need to be restored we need to do whatever necessary to make sure that our marriages again are a blessing and are ex ex be being this example to all the world of what a right, right relationship with Christ looks like so I want to share just real quickly tonight a few things that we've got to embrace as Christians in general again it's a general but specifically for wives in your relationships with your husbands. The first thing is this, love. We've talked about this every relationship. Love is the number one thing. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, it says, but by love, serve one another. By love, serve one another. It's easy to fulfill the role of a wife whenever you just love. Not only with brotherly love, but with, with, a, with that marriage love, with, a, with a, the love of a wife for a husband. I don't love him like a, like a husband. I don't have those feelings. You don't understand how bad it is in my home. Listen, God does. He understands how bad he was treated when he was on this earth, yet he still stayed in subjection, stayed, in, 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 stayed the course, and fulfilled what God had him here to fulfill. And the Father honored that through the Son and accomplished his will because he stayed true to what he was here to accomplish. And I think if we will stay true to the roles inside of marriage, wives, that God will honor that. We've seen God do amazing things in different relationships, different marriages throughout the course of this church's history. And I promise you this, if we will just do it God's way, God will get the victory. It may not necessarily happen in our time or the way that we want, to ha want it to happen, but we have got to have love abiding. And it's got to be the driving, motivating force, and it's got to be the catalyst for us serving our husbands. Because it's, we'll get to the husbands either next week or the next week. But the husbands have the same responsibility. Matter of fact, we're, we're going to read that. But love is to be this motivator in serving one another. It's a Christian principle. Every Christian in here, if you're a Christian, man, child, uh, woman, girl, teenager, every single one of us, this is a Christian principle. Again, you should apply in the home first. Wives, you should, by love, serve your husband in the home, and others, uh, other Christians, other people. 
Ephesians chapter 5, it says this, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Here it is, verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. He's the example. Walk, live your lives in love, and hath given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Again, that's the standard. That's the precedent. You go down the verses from verse 2 down to verse 22, you see this... this, this uh, uh, juxtaposition of of the old man or the life of sin with now he goes into the roles inside of marriage so walk in love as christ also loved us that's the standard that's the precedent walk in love and he goes down to verse 22 after talking about worldliness and and, and a life of sin and he goes in verse 22 wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the lord again submission is not a bad thing it's a willing should be something that you desire to do because of it's, it's something that is pleasing to God, it's a command of God, and it's the only way that blessing is going to come in the marriage. It's not going to happen. Wives, I promise you, if you want to love life and see good days that we read a while ago, you're not going to experience that if you buck what God's command and His call is for you to be as a wife. It won't happen. Peace will not, peace will not uh, be in the home. It will not be ensued. It will not... It, it abide, it will not stay in the home if you aren't willing to say, God, this is hard. But I'm submitting to you and I'm submitting to the leadership of my husband wholeheartedly because of love. Because I love, I love him and I love you. And so that submission is, a, is, is out of a love just as Christ has loved us. He goes, for the, he, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and the Savior of the body, therefore, as the church subject to Christ. Again, it's an example. Marriage is an example of this. Therefore, as a church subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Submission is an element of love. If I love Christ and yet I'm not submitted to Him, I'm lying. Submission is a very vital element of love. If I love, I submit. It's easy. It, that's just the way it works. If I truly love the Lord and He is truly my Lord, then it's easy. What will thou have me do? What will thou have me? What do you want me to do, God? Here am I, send me. If I truly love him, then nothing can hold me down, nothing can hold me back. I'm submitted wholeheartedly to him. Again, if that's in the home, if that's where we are as Christians, period, but as Christian wives, if you have real and sincere love in your heart, again, it's a privilege, it's an honor, it's easy to say, I'm submitted to the leadership of my husband. Easy. It's just when we start getting rebellion and sin creeps in and, and, and we want our own way and we don't want something, we don't like it, we, something doesn't happen this way, we start bucking. No, circumstances aren't supposed to change the roles and the responsibilities inside of marriages. Submission is an element of love. Again, when we love God, it's easy to submit to His leadership in our life. And the same directive is true inside of the home. When you love your husbands rightly, there's nothing that's going to keep you from submitting to his leadership. There's nothing that's going to keep you uh, from his spiritual leadership. The second thing is this, lend. First thing that wives have a responsibility to do is to love. But the second thing I believe that wives need to be doing is lending. The Bible says this in Galatians chapter 5. We already read it. But by love, serve one another. There's so many scriptures that go. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. In honor, preferring one another. Uh, esteem one another highly for love's sake. And, and there, there are so many different things that we can talk about, but we are to lend, we are to serve, we are to give ourselves for other people. And that, again, applies first in the home. I will say this. I, I would probably say I've seen a lot of women that are more giving and serving of people inside the church, more giving than they are of their husbands. That should not be. That should not be. We're willing to give and serve and go over and, 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 and help and serve and, and do all those things. Those things are good. You don't have to sacrifice those things, but it needs to be happening in the home as well. You need to be willing to, to go above and beyond to serve in the home if that's what you do in the church or at your job or in outreach or whatever. We need to be willing to say, hey, I'm a servant of the Lord and I have a responsibility to submit to the Lord, to submit to my husband's leadership, and I'm given to him as a help me, I'm given to him to serve and to make our, our marriage complete. And if you're not lending, if you're not serving, if you're not giving of yourself, again, talking about grace, then it's not going to happen the way that God wants to happen. It's going to be blessed the way that God wants it to be blessed. I will say this. Here's some questions you need to ask wives 
Please write these down or remember them. Whatever you need to do. I will encourage every wife in here or young, uh, young woman who, who may be uh, going to be getting married one day and even little girls. Uh, you need to learn that these are important virtues of women and wives one day. But every wife in here, I would say you need to ask these questions. What can I do to enhance my relationship? Because oftentimes we're looking what our husbands will do or not do for us. And vice versa, husbands do the same thing. Again, keep score, competition. I'll do this if you do that. That's wrong. What can I do to add to or, or to enhance the relationship that God has given me? Or ask yourself this question as well. What am I giving with no expectation of return? What, what am I giving with no expectation of return? And so, in the end of it all, standing before God, God's not going to have this scorecard on, on how many times you served your husband and he didn't respond or he didn't thank you or he didn't say anything or, or he wasn't doing what you wanted him to do, but you did what you were supposed to do anyways. God's not keeping score of that. He's not going to do that. At the end of it all, when we stand before God, we are going to be accountable for what we do, regardless of what anybody else does. And so wives, you stand before God, stand before Him knowing that you gave, that you enhanced, even in the hardest of times, even in the most unlikely of times, even when things were difficult, you gave just like Christ gave when it was difficult. You, you gave, you enhanced, you, you submitted even when it wasn't fun to do so, if you will. Again, lending. You do it because God says so. You give because God says so. It's not just a robotic, well, I'm supposed to submit, so I guess I'm going to do this. I'll do this this time again. I'll do this again. Uh, you know, I guess I'm going to go through these emotions again. No, not robotic. Again, love is to be the motive. Love is to be the driving force in our relationship at all times. See, I think, just like I was talking about last Wednesday night, we can just grasp just a little bit in our human understanding, just a little bit the love that, that God had for us in sending His only Son, his, the precious Lamb of God, to shed even one drop of blood for our sins. That type of love, when our mind can wrap around that just a little bit, then when he says, love one another as I have loved you, then to serve in the home and to lend and to give of ourselves in the same manner that Christ gave, it's incomparable. So we should be going around in our marriages, hey, I'll give, I'll serve, I'll do. We get selfish though. Both parts often get selfish in, in the marriage. But we have to remember, it's not dependent upon if our spouse does. We are to serve in our roles that God has given to us. Again, these are important responsibilities. Love, lend. The third thing is this, listen. Again, guys, we're going to get our dose. It's coming. So, but this is something that wives are, have a responsibility as well. Listen. The reality is this. We don't have to raise embarrassing hands. I'm going to put both of them out of my pocket. But women are typically better listeners than guys. How many guys are really good listeners in here? Women, women have... I, some of you know my wife better than some of you. I'll just tell her right now. I don't, may embarrass her, but I'm going to give honor to her. She has amazing hearing. She has hearing that is... Superhuman. It is. There are things that she hears that she says, you don't hear that? No, I don't. Listen. No, still don't. Still don't hear. She has amazing hearing. But there's a difference between hearing and listening. And I will say this. She's a way better listener than me. She listens because I believe women typically are wired as better listeners. And with all of that listening and all that information going in, women also tend to be better talkers. There's more information to come out because all the information that goes in has to come out at some point in time. And so maybe that's why God wired us. There may be a level. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the problem is. I know I love her dearly, but there are... And it's not because of love, but there are times that she says that she's told me things, and I, 
we are in two different worlds. Because I do not remember that at all. I've told you three times. Oh, no. No, I don't think so. You know, Yes, I have. You've got a question, though, if there's so much talking. Maybe there's, there's, there's a lot of losing of... I don't know. I'm sorry. But um, the reality is that women typically are better listeners than guys. There's no doubt about it. Women uh, are, are, are do that. But I, I will say this. I'll go a bit further. I've never heard anybody say this. This is just Kyle's philosophy. Whatever. You, this is just my thought. I think that that's one of the reasons why God created woman to be a help me because it's part of the balance. Because if you look at all the deficiencies in, in guys, like women have everything wonderful, you know, um, like their emotions. Sometimes guys are just. And women are like, you can't. <laughs> not, nope, not there. <clears throat> But there, there, there is a balance. And again, I think that God gave uh, this special um, gift of listening. There's no doubt. I, I believe that with all, all my heart. Um, maybe his thought was, you know, men, I just know they're not going to listen very well. So I'm going to create a woman to help him out. You know, They'll hear the important things when someone is telling them instructions or directions about important things they need to know. And when they're going somewhere... The woman will say, no, remember, it's here, it's there, it's supposed to be that, it's supposed to be that. Um, anyways, God, I, I think God did that. Um, but it's important to, to listen with also spiritual ears in, in the marriage. And that, that's crucial, I think, um, because there is a, a tendency, even with, with wives, in listening and having the abilities that they have and being emotional and, and, and sharing their feelings and, and talking, even though I, I joked about it a little bit while ago, the wives and women often talk more than men. I, I want to be careful to say this because it's important for wives to get this as well. James chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, again, this is the standard rule for every Christian, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19 as well, it says, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin. But he that refraineth his lips is wise. The tongue of the just is as choice silver, and the heart of the wicked is little worth. And the wives, God, I believe God gave women, He gave wives a wonderful gift of being good listeners. There's no doubt about it. Yes, there's time that, that speaking is necessary and saying certain things necessary, but remember what Scripture says. It's crucial to be swift to hear and slow to speak. I want to encourage every wife in here, in your marriages, be slow to speak. Don't, don't just let the words come off uh, as they hit your heart, as they come to your mind. Be slow to speak. Slow to wrath, the Bible says. Don't just utter whatever comes out, whatever you're feeling. Yes, you're more emotional. Yes, you, you listen better. Yes, all those things are in there. But you have to also make sure that you're truly being more of a hearer, a listener, than you are just letting your words fly. Listen to the voice of the Lord. Listen to spiritual leadership, and, and very specifically the spiritual leadership of your husband. That just shifted the whole weight on top of us as husbands. The whole weight of the home, spiritual leadership, falls on us. We have a responsibility to, to teach and to lead so that our wives do listen to the spiritual leadership. So when we say, no, we're not, we don't need to do that, or yes, we need to do this, or yeah, we need to give to that, or, or you know what, that, that, that's, that's not very becoming, or hey, this is that, the wives have no issue at all listening to that spiritual leadership because we're spiritually leading in the home. And so again, women need a, a, a spiritual example, not that women are, are insufficient in them, of themselves, but it's the way that God designed it. They, they are supposed to follow the leadership of man in the home, so we have the weight on us. Maybe husbands in here are saying, Brother Kyle, you're not helping me very much. You know, I'm not liking the direction this is going right here. But I promise you, again, your marriage will be so enhanced. Guys, if you'll just take the leadership spiritual. Again, it's not about putting your thumb down. It's, it's about lovingly leading in a spiritual way. If you will take hold of those reins and run with it. And not ask your wife, but lead her. Not say, do you feel like this? Do you want to do this? Hey, should we serve this? Should we do that? No, this is what we're doing. This is what, you know, hey, let's pray about this. God's put this on my heart. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's serve God. 
Women need that spiritual leadership again because it's the way that God set it up. So our responsibility as husbands is very serious. And last of all, it's similar to listening. It's learning. Wives, be learners. Be learners. Love, love with everything inside of you. Lend, serve with no expectations of return. Be a listener before you're a speaker. And, and learn. No, don't just let the words come in, but learn. You listen to the leadership of, of the Lord. Listen to the spiritual leadership of your husband and learn. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 35. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it's a shame for women to speak in the church. It's talking about the order inside of the church. He was talking about spiritual gifts in chapter 12. 13, he was talking about the motive behind any, every, any and every gift. The best gift of all is love, charity. And then in chapter 14, he begins to describe the order inside of the, the church in which these things are supposed to happen. And he says, listen, the women don't have a, a responsibility, a, a right, a privilege, a, a role to, to, to speak or to share spiritual truth inside the body of Christ. In, in the general assembly, if you will. Yes, inside the body of Christ. Yes, Sunday school classrooms, women's ministries, all those things. Yes, but as far as the assembly of the con- in, in the congregation, there's not a, a role, a, a right, a responsibility, a privilege that women have been given for that cause. And so if something happens or something's taught and preached in the church and the woman says, I, that don't make sense to me. I don't agree with that. And so I'm going to go talk to the pastor. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Go ask your husband first. Go, go, go. Go ask Him and and get clarity and pray and seek His spiritual leadership in your life first. Because if He's spiritually leading, He can can point you, hey, this is what it is. Or if something wrong, something is spoken wrong by the pastor, the husband can come and say, hey, an issue. It doesn't mean that that, that, that ladies, that the pastors and ministers of this church, that I'm not available to help and to guide, to to counsel, all those things, those things are real. But you have to be a learner at the home, in the home first. Go to your husband. Ask him. Husbands, seek the Lord so that you have an answer. Seek the Lord's face. Be learners. You can learn from teachers, like I said. You can learn from pastors. But learn from your husbands first. Husbands, lead. Set that example. Teach. And be a wise learner, ladies. I, I want to be a learner of wisdom. Be, be an obtainer of biblical wisdom. Wisdom. It's similar to listening, but make sure that you're learning wisdom, godly wisdom. There's a lot, there's a lot of wives that foolishness abides in because there is so much speaking. There's not enough listening and learning of wisdom. There's a lot of wives that foolishness abides because they're listening to the wrong voices. And they're learning from the wrong sources. Again, we have a responsibility as Christians to seek those things that are above. There's a wisdom that descends from above. And it comes from God and it comes because we seek for it and we search it and we listen for it and we learn of God the wisdom that's available. So be a good listener and be a wise learner. In Proverbs chapter 1 it says this, A wise man will hear and increase in learning, but a man of understanding and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. So be a, a learner of, of wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 9, verse 9, give instruction, instructions to a wise man, and he will yet uh, be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Again, wives, it's crucial. And the reason why I say it's crucial is because to be that help me, to be that, 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 that strength and encouragement for your, your husband, you need these things. You need love. You need to lend. You need to listen and you need to learn. There's all of the things that we could have covered. This is what the Lord's put on my heart. Again, we have a great responsibility inside of marriages. Wives, your responsibility, your role is in sync with, but it's, it's independent of your husband's. You are to do it because God said it. And it's to be done with love. And it's to be done with a cheerful heart. And God will bless that. God will take his hand and bless that. And so as the musicians make their way, I want to encourage you tonight, if you're a wife, maybe you say, you know what, I don't feel like doing any of those things. Or maybe you say, I'm struggling with those things. Or maybe you say, I'm trying to do those things and we're still struggling. I want to encourage you to come down tonight and just maybe lay your life, lay, you know, physically there at your seat. Just say, Lord, I'm submitting to you. Just as, as Jesus was my example, 
and submitting to you, Father. I'm submitting to you. I'm submitting to the role of a wife the way that you've called me to be. And I will say this, every single man, woman, and child in here, that should be our heart. God, I'm here. I'm submitted to you. Have your way in my life. And so maybe that's what you need to pray tonight. But during this invitation, I want to encourage you. Let's, let's submit to what God's roles are for us in our life, the responsibilities he's given us. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this day. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to open your word. God, I thank you for the blessing of marriage. I thank you for my wife and family. Lord, I thank you for uh, just how good you are to us in our lives, but giving us uh, help meets and, and give us spouses and uh, the blessing of marriage. I pray that even our children in here would realize how important marriage is and how much of a blessing it is, and they'll grow up and they'll keep themselves pure until marriage, and, and they, they'll realize that it's a gift from, from you uh, to steward, and they'll enjoy a, a blessing uh, when it's their time to get married. And Maybe there's teenagers or young adults in here that are, are trying to rush into that or, 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 or trying to get there faster than what your will is for their life. I pray that they would just now tonight hear the message and just be willing to submit their life to you and yield to you and be the person you've called them to be until you bring that person in their life. Or whatever the case, whatever the need tonight, maybe there's a marriage that's hurting, maybe there's a broken marriage, maybe, maybe there's a, a marriage that's on the verge. God, I pray that the wives here tonight would take responsibility of what they're supposed to do no matter what, and that even the husbands in here tonight would yield themselves to being the spiritual leader that they're supposed to be, and that you would bless now. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand. As they play, play once you come this morning or this evening, and uh, just get right whatever you need to get right. anybody that needs to be baptized, y'all can make your way. Anybody need to be baptized, you can make your way. 